Hey, hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time, but please note, that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have allotted time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Treatment Strategies for Palactinomas, is being presented by Dr. James K. Liu. Dr. Liu is the Director of Cerebrovascular, Skull Base, and Pituitary Surgery at the Rutgers Neurological Institute of New Jersey and Professor of Neurological Surgery at Rutgers University, New Jersey Medical School. He is board certified by the American Board of Neurological Surgery and has a robust pituitary tumor practice at the University Hospital and St. Barnabas Medical Center. Dr. Liu graduated summa cum laude from UCLA with a Phi Beta Kappa honors and obtained his MD from New York Medical College with AOA honors. After completing a neurosurgery residency at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, he was awarded the Dandy Clinical Fellowship by the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and obtained advanced fellowship training in skull base, cerebrovascular surgery, and neuro-oncology at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Dr. Liu is renowned for his comprehensive treatment of complex brain tumors and skull base lesions, including pituitary tumors, acoustic neuromas, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, chordomas, and jugular foramen tumors. His robust clinical practice encompasses both traditional, open, and minimally invasive endoscopic endonasal skull base approaches. As one of the most active researchers in his field, Dr. Liu has published extensively with over 250 peer-reviewed publications and 25 textbook chapters. He has taught many hands-on cadaver dissection courses in skull-based surgery and has lectured extensively nationally and internationally throughout North America and Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Dr. Liu is an active member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, North American Skull Base Society, Pituitary Network Association, the Facial Pain Trigeminal Neuralgia Association, AANS CNS Cerebrovascular Section Tumor Section. He serves on the Medical Advisory Board of the Acoustic Neuroma Association of New Jersey and is the current Secretary Treasurer of the International Meningioma Society. Dr. Liu, thank you so much for your involvement with the PNA's webinar program. We've already changed presenters. We're already showing your screen. So um, you can go ahead and take it away. Great, uh, great Tammy and the PNA. It's, uh, it's an honor to give this webinar for uh, our viewers and audience of the Pituitary Network Association. Um, Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about prolactinomas, uh, which is a, a strong area of interest for me. Uh, we see a lot of prolactinomas in our practice, and I think there are uh, various evolving treatment strategies uh, in the last decade that I think are important to shed light upon. Um, let's go over the basics. What are prolactinomas? Well, basically, they're pituitary tumors that secrete the hormone prolactin, and they are derived from cells that we call lactotroph cells uh, within the pituitary gland. And they are very common, accounting for about 40% of all pituitary tumors and about 50 to 60% of all functional pituitary tumors. Functional meaning these are pituitary tumors that secrete an active hormone. And most of the time, these are small tumors uh, when they're found in females. However, when these tumors present in males, they tend to be uh, much larger. And we'll go over that in a moment. And of course, giant prolactinomas, which are defined as greater than four centimeters, can just be more invasive uh, and sometimes more dangerous. And these are more rare, about two to three percent. What is the clinical presentation? Um, let's start with the presentation in women, actually. Um, in women, the, the common presentation is galactorrhea and amenorrhea, which is basically uh, secretion of milk from the breasts. Uh, spontaneously and also irregular or even absent periods. And when this arises, this generally alerts the practitioner that perhaps the prolactin level could be high. And why is this a problem? Well, this, this often results in infertility for women 
and inability of having children. So why are these tumors larger in men? Well, men generally don't present with galacteria and amenorrhea. So these tumors continue to grow to very large sizes until they start to compress surrounding structures such as the optic nerves, which can cause headaches and visual loss and other cranial neuropathies. Um, so, so those that present with an endocrine syndrome, such as the galacteria, amenorrhea, tend to be more readily detected, and they tend to present early, at earlier stages with smaller tumors. How is the pathway uh, uh, for this work? Well, the prolactinoma, as you see in this diagram, secretes uh, elevated excess prolactin, which then goes and negatively inhibits gonadotropin releasing hormone and the inhibition of the sex steroids which are LH luteinizing hormone and FSH follicle secreting hormone and this in turn impairs gonadal steroidogenesis and this results in hypogonadism and infertility and also it can reduce bone mineral density which can uh, result in osteopenia and osteoporosis. So here's a case example of a microprolactinoma, and this is generally, we generally find the small microprolactinomas in younger women, generally anywhere from age, um, you know, as, as young as the late teens to uh, mid-20s, and you can see this is a 20-year-old female who has this microprolactinoma right here, and they generally look uh, darker than the normal gland. You can see the normal gland is this bright signal here. This is the normal pituitary gland pushed to the side. Here's the coronal view showing the normal gland to the left side of the cell line. Here is the microprolactinoma. And generally these do not cause optic chiasmal compression. Here's the optic chiasm still free of compression. And the level of prolactin generally tends to correlate with the size of the tumor. So if this is truly a prolactinoma, the prolactin levels can range anywhere from say over 65 to say about 200 to about 250. There's no set uh, strict number, but this is the general ballpark. As we get into larger tumors, Larger tumors tend to secrete a lot more prolactin hormone. And you can see in this case, this is a macroprolactinoma with extension into the cavernous sinus. And when we see extension into the cavernous sinus, uh, the prolactin level starts to go above 1,000. And in this case, you see that the prolactin level is over 2,000 in this, in this case. So, Important things that we have to rule out, we have to rule out pregnancy in women. Uh, we also have to look at uh, chronic renal failure and liver cirrhosis, as well as hypothyroidism. These can all be causes that can elevate the prolactin level. The other important uh, component we have to rule out is you can have other types of pituitary masses, either a uh, Rathke's cleft cyst, a craniopharyngioma, or even a non-functioning pituitary tumor that's compressing the pituitary stock. And sometimes just the compression of the pituitary stock can elevate the prolactin level. So you have to, uh, the practitioner has to be able to distinguish the level of the prolactin that is due to pituitary stock compression as opposed to a true prolactin secreting prolactinoma. Uh, there are other idiopathic, meaning uh, uh, no uh, known causes of hyperprolactinemia. It can be physiologic. Sometimes we see it in uh, someone who exercises uh, uh, heavily. Uh, certain medications are very well known to cause elevated prolactin, usually the antidepressants and antipsychotic medications. Uh, risperidone is a uh, classic cause of elevated prolactin uh, in a lot of patients that we see. So let's talk about the stock effect for a moment. So this is a patient who has a very, uh, this, uh, who has a large macro prolactinoma, I'm sorry, 
a, a large pituitary macroadenoma. And the initial prolactin level here was 65. And it was um, managed by this patient's primary care physician who started the patient on bromocryptine, assuming that this was a prolactinoma. Uh, however, uh, even though the prolactin level normalized, meaning the, the level of 65 went to a normal level, the tumor continued to increase in size and she continued to experience worsening function. Uh, she then came to us for a second opinion and when we looked over the blood work, it was our feeling that the level of 65, given this size of tumor, was more consistent with pituitary stock compression effect. Usually when you see a tumor of this size, one would expect the prolactin level to be roughly greater than three to 400 or so. So a level of 65 should alert the practitioner that this could be a non-functioning tumor causing stock compression effect. So in this case, Bromocryptine or cabergoline would be the wrong treatment and surgical transphenoidal decompression to relieve compression on the optic chiasm would be the proper treatment. So she went on to have surgery and we got a complete removal and preserved her gland and uh, she was able to uh, have children after that. Uh, medications, uh, any kind of medications that disrupt the dopamine system uh, or mechanism of its receptor can potentially increase prolactin levels. Uh, here are a number, a list of different types of medications that can do that. Uh, most of these are uh, antidepressants and uh, some antipsychiatric medications that can affect this uh, dopamine pathway. So the diagnostic workup, we need to do a very thorough medical history, including a list of current medications, complete physical exam and routine laboratory analyses, and the lab should include the whole battery of anterior pituitary hormones. Uh, we also need to do biochemical testing to exclude renal and liver insufficiencies. And in women, it's very important to do a pregnancy test as this can also elevate prolactin. In terms of imaging, uh, it's important to get a dedicated MRI of the pituitary with and without gadolinium. Oftentimes, uh, practitioners can order just an MRI of the brain, and uh, it may miss uh, some details of this cellar and pituitary region. So it's important that your doctor orders an MRI of the pituitary because there will be higher resolution slices through that small region of the pituitary gland. So we said that the tumor sizes tend to correlate with the level of prolactin. Now, you, one should be aware of what's called the hook effect. Uh, in cases of giant prolactinomas, such as the one featured here, uh, this could potentially produce a falsely low prolactin level due to what we call the high dose hook effect. And it's, it's due to the way the prolactin level is measured in the laboratory. Uh, most laboratories these days uh, know how to avoid it. But just to let you know, it was described because when you have a giant tumor like this that is producing, in this case, was producing 40,000, uh, a level of 40, a prolactin level of 40,000, it uh, overwhelms the uh, measuring assay system so that all the binding sites are saturated and that the uh, antibody that detects the other antibody that binds the prolactin only recognizes the ones that have been bound so that the unbound ones don't get measured and you get a falsely low prolactin level. And we call that the hook effect. So how, how do you overcome that? The practitioner should alert the laboratory to do uh, serial dilutions uh, so that you uh, can dilute the, uh, the blood levels to calculate the prolactin and then uh, correct uh, for the dilution effect to get the accurate number. 
So this is important in terms of getting an accurate diagnosis. So the first, the goals of treatment for hyperprolactinemia is to normalize the prolactin levels so that we avoid the deleterious uh, consequences. Uh, also to reduce tumor mass effect if it's compressing the optic nerves and chiasm. And we want to be able to preserve the uh, remaining pituitary function and also to prevent disease recurrence or progression. So the first line of therapy is uh, medications uh, in the form of dopamine agonists. And, and the two major medications that we typically use are bromocryptine and cabergoline, and these are approved both in the United States. So how do these work? Um, uh, we, when we're dealing with microprolactinomas, uh, we should make sure that the patient is actually having symptoms. Some patients may not be symptomatic, and in those cases, you may not want to consider treatment because treatment does have some side effects to it. Um, however, of course, those who are symptomatic with amenorrhea and galacteria, uh, it's certainly uh, important to consider initiating medical treatment. Um, these are generally effective in 80 to 90 percent of cases and uh, for those who have hypogonadism, uh, dopamine agonist therapy has been found to restore gonadal function. For patients with macroprolactinomas, normalization of prolactin levels can be achieved in about 85 percent of patients with tumor shrinkage of at least 25 percent seen in 80 percent of patients. So these drugs are very effective in correcting the prolactin level and also shrinking the tumor. Let's talk about bromocryptine. This was uh, uh, an earlier used drug, but still commonly used. It's an ergo derivative. It's a D2 selective dopamine agonist and a D1 antagonist. Generally, it's taken twice daily, sometimes three times a day. And we start with uh, uh, low doses, usually uh, in, in our practice, generally 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams a day and slowly increased. And we have to watch uh, for adverse side effects. These can cause a broad side effect uh, uh, profile, generally affecting the gastrointestinal system. Patients can commonly complain of nausea, vomiting, constipation, uh, reflux, just GI upset in general. Sometimes you can have headaches, dizziness, movement disorders, and some confusion. Uh, some patients can experience uh, feeling lightheaded from low blood pressure, and sometimes even fainting uh, that we call syncope. Cabergoline is also an ergo derivative. Uh, it's a D2 agonist, and this drug is much more potent than uh, bromocryptine. It, it's also much more expensive. So this is taken roughly, uh, mostly twice a week, starting with 0 0.25 to 0.5 per week until the prolactin normalizes. And this has been very effective in treating uh, very large, aggressive macroprolactinomas, that have been resistant to bromocryptine. Um, Cabergoline, however, has been questioned uh, due to recent studies demonstrating an association between the use of these medications in Parkinson's disease and having cardiac valvular uh, problems. Uh, however, the dosage of cabergoline can be given to Parkinson's uh, far exceeds the dosage that one gets for prolactinoma treatment. So um, it's still an area of, of controversy, but I think it's something certainly to be aware of. So uh, some recommend echocardiogram surveillance if someone's been on long-term prolonged treatment on cabergoline. So let's look at a few case examples. Uh, this is a 41-year-old male you could see he has this very large macroprolactinoma. This was initially diagnosed with having a prolactin level of over 3,000. 
The tumor has supracellular extension compressing the optic chiasm and lateral extension invading the cavernous sinus. So he was um, initially started with bromocryptine. And uh, three months later, you can see there's uh, been some considerable tumor shrinkage and the prolactin level came down to roughly 200. One year later, the patient developed resistance to bromocryptine and had recurrent tumor growth. So at this point, bromocryptine was switched to cabergoline and you can see now the follow-up MRI in the third panel shows further decrease of the tumor with further decrease of the prolactin level to 56. So when we compare the two drugs, cabergoline uh, is more effective in controlling hyperprolactinemia, hyperprolactinemia and tumor shrinkage and generally has a lower side effect profile and a higher patient compliance. On the other hand, bromocryptine uh, is cheaper and some argue that it could be the treatment choice for pregnant women only because the drug has been out longer and has been studied longer. And of course, there are other uh, drugs that are been studied uh, uh, in the literature and also uh, Europe, but currently these are not approved uh, by the US FDA. So during pregnancy, this question arises uh, frequently. Um, the weight of the pituitary gland increases by a third, and along with many other anatomical and physiological changes. Estrogen from the placenta causes hypertrophy of lactotrophs and stimulates prolactin secretion. So in women who have an existing prolactinoma, the concern is that pre in, during pregnancy, this rapid increase in estrogen will cause the prolactinoma to grow. And it certainly can happen. So it's important that during pregnancy, you have to monitor uh, patients with serial uh, visual field testing with the neuro-ophthalmologist. Um, serial MRI scans can also be obtained, uh, but one should obtain it without contrast. So the risk of symptomatic growth during pregnancy is roughly 2.2 to 5% in women with microprolactinoma. So it's low. The risk of growth in a smaller tumor is low, but if you have an existing larger tumor, macroprolactinoma, the risk goes up to 31%. And the possible adverse effects of dopamine agonists on fetal development remain the main concern. So it's recommended that when one becomes pregnant and it's been confirmed, uh, one should discontinue the uh, dopamine agonist therapy and then be monitored every trimester and more frequently for those who have larger tumors or who have changes in visual symptoms or headaches. Uh, of course, if there is symptomatic tumor expansion, dopamine agonist treatment should be restarted with continuing the monitor of symptoms. So the outcomes of sustaining normal prolactin levels after initiating medical therapy uh, and after withdrawal of the medical therapy have been variable, ranging from 7% to greater than 50%. And the percentage of patients who relapse after stopping medical therapy is still under debate. There is a study by Decker et al. that demonstrated stable normal prolactin levels after stopping dopamine agonist therapy in 32% of patients. And these are patients with idiopathic hyperprolactinemia, 21% in microprolactinomas, and 16% in macroprolactinomas. And um, this is in contrast to a study by Colau in uh, Europe who demonstrated persistent normal prolactin levels after withdrawal in 66% of microprolactinomas and 47% of macroprolactinomas. Uh, in general, though, when one stops medical therapy, I think it's very important to continue long-term surveillance with serial uh, pituitary function testing and serial prolactin levels. 
Um, I think if there is uh, still cells, lactotrophs remaining, uh, they can be at potential risk of recurrence of producing the hormone once you stop the medication. So dopamine agonist therapy withdrawal can be suggested for those patients whose prolactin level has been normalized, fully corrected, and there's no tumor on the MRI or at least reduction of tumor size in at least 50% and no invasion of, say, the cavernous sinus for at least two years. Drug withdrawal may be attempted after about four years of medical therapy. The dosage of the dopamine agonist should be gradually decreased while maintaining normal prolactin levels until the drug is completely discontinued. And follow-up should be more frequent in the first year after medication cessation as recurrence is most commonly observed during the first six months to one year after stopping the medication. It's important to have regular follow-ups uh, at three-month intervals in the first year and then annually for, a last, for at least five years post-withdrawal. Uh, in any event, I strongly recommend lifelong monitoring. And of course, bigger tumors, macroprolactinomas, uh, should be monitored uh, with an MRI six months post withdrawal and annually thereafter. So, a clear consensus on the definition of dopamine agonist resistance has yet to be reached, uh, though there are some more widely accepted criteria. Um, with respect to the hormone level, it's usually defined as a failure to normalize the prolactin levels to below 50% of the initial level, and also the failure to reduce the tumor size by at least 50% while on the maximal dose. <clears throat> we see about 10% patients resistant to cabergoline, and about 25% can be resistant to bromocryptine. Uh, secondary resistance is rare, and it's important to rule out other things such as uh, malignant transformation, transformation of the tumor into a more aggressive lesion, or uh, poor compliance uh, from the patient. And if it is truly resistant, uh, typically we will switch to a more potent uh, dopamine agonist. If one is if one has been started on bromocryptine, we will switch to cabergoline, or if one was initially started on cabergoline, you have to gradually increase the dosage. And for invasive, aggressive adenomas, one can consider temozolomide uh, for uh, more aggressive, invasive uh, adenomas. And this is a medication that we typically use to treat uh, glioma uh, brain tumors. So. The next option is surgery, and uh, when is surgery considered an option for prolactinomas? Well, in general, uh, surgery is an option when a uh, patient has persistent hyperprolactinemia and it is medically resistant uh, to the effects of medications in, in a way where the tumor causes mass effect on the optic chiasm or if the tumor spontaneously hemorrhages and causes rapid expansion, a condition we call pituitary apoplexy, if this is causing an immediate threat to the vision, uh, we would prefer to perform urgent decompression of the optic chiasm as opposed to um, a trial of medical therapy. Um, there is uh, one indication that I'll discuss uh, shortly on uh, for microprolactinomas, and I'll go in that to detail, but this can be a reasonable option in individuals who may have potentially curable microprolactinomas who have either failed medical therapy or do not wish to be on lifelong medical therapy. And there are a number of factors that can affect that. And surgery may also be indicated in patients who are dependent on antipsychotic medications, such as dopamine agonists, which may agitate psychotic episodes. Uh, Transphenoidal surgery uh, is an effective modality, and um, 
it can have the uh, have potential high cure rates, and this is certainly center and surgeon dependent uh, in experienced centers. We generally look at postoperative day one prolactin level less than 10 as a uh, predictive of long-term cure. And then um, a recent study that we uh, published here from Rutgers, we did a cost effectiveness uh, study looking at upfront surgery for microprolactinomas. Uh, and, and we demonstrated that it can be cost effective in the long run in carefully selected patients. Uh, if one has a very high surgical cure rate and a very low complication rate. So let's take a look at a few examples. This is an example of a 15-year-old girl who had presented with headaches, dizziness, and amenorrhea. You can see on the MRI scan there is a cystic microprolactinoma here on the left side of the cella. This bright signal here is the normal pituitary gland. And the initial prolactin level here was 196. And um, she had uh, undergone a, a short trial of medical therapy and didn't like the, um, the side effects. And being at the age of 15, she did not want to be on lifelong medical therapy uh, given the, the long life expectancy that she had. So we felt that this was a potentially curable tumor. What are the features that we can consider? We can see that there's actually a focal tumor here on the MRI. So you have to be able to see the tumor. You have to be able to see where the gland is. And the prolactin level should be roughly less than 250, although we've been able to push it to roughly less than 400. But in general, a prolactin level of less than 250, absence of cavernous sinus extension, these are all factors that would be favorable for a surgical candidate. So we went ahead and, and removed this tumor and uh, she had a surgical cure and we maintain her normal pituitary function and uh, she has been recurrence free for the last five years. So again, I think this is a controversial topic, but I think it can be considered uh, in select cases. So this is a study that uh, we um, presented at a uh, pituitary skull-based meeting several years ago. Uh, the initial abstract was 17 patients. We're now up to 30 patients now that we've carefully selected uh, for endoscopic surgery. The inclusion criteria were microprolactinomas or uh, what we call mesoprolactinomas, up to 20 millimeters, where there's no evidence of cavernous invasion, the initial prolactin level less than 400, uh, and those uh, who underwent palliative debulking without the intent to cure were excluded. So these were small tumors that were focal, where the intent here was to cure. All the patients in the study were female, who had small tumors and presented with amenorrhea, galactorrhea, and headaches. Uh, as expected, there were no visual def deficits preoperatively, the average age being 28 to 33. The uh, initial uh, prolactin level at the time of diagnosis was roughly 175, and with the mean prolact preoperative prolactin level of 191. And of these 17 patients, 70% 70 of these patients had failed medical therapy due to development of dopamine agonist resistance or intolerance. Three had undergone prior microscopic surgery at other hospitals. And then five of these patients chose surgery as the first line treatment without having undergone previous medical or surgical therapy. Uh, and um, just to shed some light, uh, we work in a uh, uh, urban med. Uh, one of the hospitals we practice at is in an urban medical center, 
where there are patients who don't have insurance and cannot afford expensive medications such as carbergalin uh, and so forth. And so in carefully selected patients, uh, I think this is a reasonable uh, option to offer so that they can avoid lifelong out-of-pocket expenses for their medication. So here are the results. We achieved biochemical remission in 94.1% of patients, and the biochemical remission was defined as post-operative day one prolactin level uh, within normal limits, and we achieved biochemical cure in 100% of the microprolactinomas and 92.1% in the mesoprolactinomas with one failure. And we'll go over that one failure in a moment. All 17 patients had resolution of their symptoms, including normalization of periods, resolution of the galactorrhea, and the relief of headaches and visual disturbances. 94.1% maintained uh, in remission with normal prolactinomas at the most recent follow-up. And the mean follow-up here was about 50 months. We did not have any operative mortalities. There were no cranial nerve or optic nerve meningitis complications. We did have uh, two delayed epistaxis. These are nosebleeds after discharge that required repeat cauterization in the nose. We did have one patient who uh, experienced uh, low cortisol levels that required hydrocortisone supplement, and 94.1% had normal endocrine function, not requiring any other hormone supplements. This is a table just demonstrating the post-operative day one prolactin level in the microprolactinomas, generally less than 10, is, is considered predictive of biochemical cure. This is a study that, that data came from a study from uh, Dr. Weiss in USC. <clears throat> this graph shows the association between the tumor classification and prolactin levels on post-operative day one and two. So while the patients are in the hospital, we continue to monitor the prolactin level, and you can see that the prolactin level will co continue to fall uh, from day one to day two. And this table shows the same data uh, in a different perspective. You can see the drop in prolactin in microprolactinoma cases. The, the delta, if you will, is larger than the drop that we saw in our mesoprolactinoma population. So here's a case example. This is 37-year-old female had prior surgery at a, another hospital, failed medical therapy, now has a prolactin level of 152. And you can see on the MRI, it's a rather small tumor. It's focal. It presents itself right to the sphenoid sinus. So it's very favorable for resection. It's already failed medical therapy. And we were able to achieve a surgical cure, preserve the normal gland, and now she has a normal prolactin level of 6.9. This is what the tumor looked like. You can see that the, these tumors generally have a nice, round, smooth surface that we call the pseudocapsule. And if you can find the pseudocapsule, and this is a nice surgical technique to be able to peel the pseudocapsule away from the normal gland. This is the same technique that we use for Cushing's disease in order to try to get a better cure rate for Cushing's. So the technique is very similar. The philosophy is very similar. Here's an example. Again, this is a, a microprolactinoma here. You can see the prolactinoma being separated. <clears throat> this is the normal gland that's being preserved. Here we have a pseudocapsule that we're peeling away from the normal gland. Here's the normal gland stuck to the arachnoid of the cella and the normal gland has been preserved, and then we reconstruct the cella, and we're able to get a post-operative cure of a prolactin level of 2.1. This is a 26-year-old, and we preserved her normal gland, and she can now live a lifelong without taking medical therapy. 
certainly we have to continue to monitor her lifelong as to uh, detect any recurrence. Here is a video showing the endoscopic endonasal transphenoidal technique. This is the part where we enter the sphenoid sinus. And here we are opening the bone over the cella tersica. We'll go ahead and open up the dura mater overlying the pituitary. And in this case, the adenoma is situated here on the left side. You can see it's uh, right up against the wall of the cavernous sinus. So it's very common to get venous bleeding from the cavernous sinus. It's readily controlled with gentle packing. And so we'll go ahead and start to dissect the tumor out. And then we could use this uh, dissector to come around the lateral margin of the tumor, peel it away from the wall of the cavernous sinus, and uh, carefully deliver it. And with our other instrument, we'll dissect it away from the normal pituitary gland. And here's the final removal of the tumor. A little bit of venous bleeding is easily controlled with a gel foam pledget. And this is the final view. You can see the normal gland here has been preserved. This is where the tumor used to sit, right in the tumor cavity. And here's the post-op scan. You can see the tumor has been removed. The prolactin level uh, uh, has come, come down to uh, normal levels. Now this is a different case. This is a, a case of a 37-year-old female who had a prolactin level of 162, uh, went down to 24 on, on bromocryptine. Uh, she began developing uh, side effects from this and didn't want to take the medication anymore. So when we stopped the medication, of course the prolactin level went up. And so you can see the tumor here on the MRI is going to be on the left side. Here you can see the tumor is being developed here within the gland, and once we remove the tumor, you can see this is the normal pituitary gland. We can continue to preserve the normal gland, preserve the normal gland function, and uh, this patient did not require any additional hormone replacement therapy. So the prolactin level came down to 3.7, down from 24, and this is another example of a larger tumor uh, mesoprolactinoma, surgical cure, and uh, normal prolactin levels. Um, lastly, this is an example of a larger tumor. This is what we would call a mesoprolactinoma, not a micro. You can see the tumor is much larger. Prolactin level is 70. Uh, patient was unresponsive and failed medical therapy. Also had some side effects to medical therapy. Here is the sphenoid sinus. We're opening the dura mater here in the, in the uh, cellar floor. You can see the tumor is nice and uh, soft, very favorable for removal. And we'll go ahead and open up the dura mater uh, wider to get a larger opening to access the tumor. Now, interestingly, the top of the tumor was not as soft as the lower part. This is the upper part, a little bit more fibrous. Not uncommon to have a fibrous tumor after someone's been on bromocryptine for a number of years. Uh, that can happen, so uh, one should be aware of it. Uh, but we can uh, develop a nice plane. Here's the normal gland, and here's the remainder of the tumor. We'll take it, a, take it out in a piecemeal fashion. And uh, once we remove the last bit of tumor, we like to inspect inside with the endoscope. Here you can see the arachnoid membrane that holds the CSF. This is the normal gland on the patient's right side. The normal gland is preserved. And it looked like we got a complete removal intraoperatively. This is the post-op scan. You can see the tumor has been removed. Notice the normal gland here is preserved the normal pituitary stalk and the chiasm is decompressed and the prolactin level is normalized to 5.2. So we did have one surgical failure. This is the one patient who did not meet a uh, requirement for uh, biochemical remission. This patient had a
preoperative prolactin level of 465. Uh, back in 2001, uh, she had a prior surgery by another surgeon and was maintained on, on uh, bromocryptine. And then it became unresponsive to Dostonex, which is cabergoline. Uh, and so I think the take home message here is that uh, you should be aware of if what the original prolactin level was. You can see the original prolactin level here was over 400. It was a more invasive tumor. It had undergone uh, prior multiple surgeries. And so here, these kinds of cases may not be curable. However, the surgery that we performed allowed us to debulk the tumor and it made the tumor more sensitive to subsequent medical therapy. Uh, so here's the tumor as it recurred with a prolactin level of 152. And this is the tumor that we ended up operating on. And uh, the prolactin level came down to 31, but then uh, it went back up to 89. But she was not symptomatic. And so for a number of years, we didn't have to restart any medical therapy. So uh, typically, studies demonstrate a high rate of surgical cure for microprolactinomas and a low rate for macroprolactinomas, leaving the assumption that those 10 millimeters or above are usually unsuccessful. Uh, I think there's a strong consideration for surgical treatment should be given to patients harboring smaller tumors with moderate hyperprolactinemia in which the physician or practitioner can feel that there may be a high probability of possible surgical cure. Of course, we need to, uh, there are some limitations to, to these conclusions. Uh, we need to continue to follow up uh, uh, the assessment of long-term cure as recurrence can occur. And uh, I think the favorable findings from our study warrant a larger series with longer-term follow-up. And uh, certainly, I think something should be said about these procedures being performed at high volume experienced endoscopic centers of excellence. Um, a few points on macroprolactinomas. These generally are very difficult to cure. The biochemical cure rate in the literature is less than 50%. So generally the goal of surgery for macroprolactinomas should, should be just to debulk the tumor, reduce the tumor size, so that you can increase the effectiveness of subsequent medical therapy, meaning you make the tumor smaller, so you sensitize it to become more responsive to medical therapy. You can also consider debulking it to a smaller size to make a favorable target for gamma knife radiosurgery. So here's an example of a macroprolactinoma. You can see part of it's cystic, and here the, this 34-year-old man had an initial prolactin level of 536. Uh, bromocryptine was initiated, but the tumor was unresponsive and the prolactin level doubled to 1,000. So we performed an endoscopic transphenoidal approach. We got a gross total resection and the prolactin level came down to 60.7. And when we started the medical therapy, he then responded. So this is an example of debulking the tumor to sensitize the remaining tumor to the medical therapy. Lastly, we'll talk about radiation therapy. Gamma knife uh, is a radiation therapy option uh, using photon beams delivered to a, uh, a, a targeted area. Uh, it has the advantage of sparing the surrounding structures uh, from radiation, and it's usually reserved when surgery and medication have both failed. You have to be careful of the tumor margin uh, and its distance to the optic nerve. So if the tumor margin is within less than two millimeters to the optic nerve, one should consider a more fractionated uh, radiation therapy in order to spare toxicity uh, to the optic nerve. Um, it's very good at tumor control. Uh, in terms of normalizing prolactin, it generally takes a much longer time than, say, medical therapy. One technique that has been described, this is a, a 
pituitary transposition where the gland is mobilized away from the radiation target where a fat graft is placed in order to reduce radiation exposure to the normal gland. And this can theoretically reduce the risk of hypopituitarism as a result of radiation exposure. So in conclusion, the medical therapy with dopamine agonists remains the mainstay of treatment. Surgery is reserved for patients refractory to medication or who are intolerant of the adverse effects. Um, I think in some select cases, uh, micro and mesoprolactinomas may be considered as a primary treatment. Uh, and uh, radio surgery is also uh, an excellent option, uh, but generally considered after both medication and surgery has generally failed. Uh, these are some references uh, that we've published recently on a review of micro, um, prolactinomas, and um, I would refer you to these references, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, I have a prolactinoma and have been on 2 milligrams a week of cabergoline for over 10 years. My tumor has shrunk about 60%, but prolactin is still high, 47 is there another medical management I should discuss with my doctor? What was the medication again? I'm sorry. It's cabergoline, two milligrams a week. Yeah, I, I think 47 is, is perfectly, you know, it may not be within the normal range, but if you're not having any symptoms of amenorrhea or galactorrhea, I don't think 47 is going to be particularly harmful. As long as you're not having the side effects, you're tolerating the medication, uh, and the tumor is not compressing the optic chiasm and it hasn't progressed or grown, I would probably just sit tight. I wouldn't consider that a uh, medical, medical treatment failure. Okay. Necessary, yeah. How many years can a patient stay on cabergoline even indefinitely? Is that okay? I'm, I'm not exactly sure if we have the long-term data on that in terms of the longest one has been on. Um, you know, I think certainly continuous monitoring and follow-up with your endocrinologist and primary care physician is very important. Um, I think the issue of the valvular disease in the heart remains a concern, so I think uh, follow-up with your, your primary care or, or any, um, any detection of any symptoms warrants further investigation. I, I don't think we know the answer to that, but, okay. but generally it's considered safe and, and most people tolerate it. Okay, and then the next question is kind of two parts, um, similar to the last one. What is considered long-term treatment for the use of cabergoline over a year? And then also, do you continue the dopamine agonist for four years for microprolactinomas or for a shorter period of time? I I think it varies. I, I think I think I would I would if I had a patient with a microprolactinoma. I would maintain them on cabergoline therapy until the prolactin is normalized. And I would only consider withdrawal of the medication if the normalization of prolactin has been maintained for several years and there is no evidence of any tumor on the MRI scan. And of course, once you stop the medication, you have to have close follow-up with an MRI and with uh, serial prolactin levels drawn to make sure that it's not going to come back. Are there any other questions? Can you hear me? 
I can now. I, okay, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I am a 47-year-old male that was diagnosed with a macroplactinoma in 2007. When cabergoline is prescribed, does the patient only have to take the drug one to two times per week? I was asked to take it two times per day and had to stop after nine months be because of the debilitating side effects. And I haven't tried bromocryptine because I fear the same debilitating side effects. I had a debulking endoscopic surgery in 2008 which, 2008, which wasn't successful. My prolactin levels were greater than 2000 when diagnosed and got as low as 270 after the surgery and has remained stable in the 275, 255 to 275 range since 2009. Should I be giving bromocryptine a try and what's the likelihood it will help me? I'm also taking humanotrope and synthroid and androgel daily too. Thank you. trying to digest that question right now. <laughs> it's, it's long. Do you want me to go read it again? Yeah, could you please? Yes, okay. Uh, I'm a 47-year-old male that was diagnosed with a ma macroplactinoma in 2007. Oh, yes, I, I, I remember now. So okay. the, initial, the initial question was the dosing of the cabergoline. Right. In general, it's about, you generally, cause it, it's such a potent drug, you, you take it twice a week. I, to my knowledge, I've not seen or heard of patients taking it twice a day. Twice a day dosing is generally bromocryptine dosing because it's not as potent, so you have to take it more frequently. Um, I, I suspect that your side effects could, may, may be related to you know, frequent dosing. I, I, I can't know for sure, but I think you should consult your, your endocrinologist. But um, I think after debulking, uh, one should consider resuming medical therapy to see if you can maintain control on it. Um, if cabergoline is not cutting it, and if you've never tried bromocryptine, it's certainly worth a try. It doesn't hurt to try. Um, you may there may just you know be aware of the the side effects. And, and, and so forth. Um, if you do develop side effects, I think, um, and the tumor is progressing, if the tumor's controlled, I think you can just monitor it, but if it continues to, to grow or the prolactin level is uh, continues to progress, um, either consider a repeat debulking or consider radio surgery or, or radiation therapy. Okay, thank you. Um, if you are 36 year old male and have been diagnosed with macroprolactinomas with serum levels, serum levels in excess of 2,000, should debulking surgery be done first and prior to taking bromocryptine or cabergoline? And if taking cabergoline, oh, I lost it. Where to go? I just a second. Uh, taking per Cabergoline prior to surgery for up to a year, can the tumor be more difficult to debulk at the time of surgery? Does the cabergoline cause the tumor in, change the tumor in a way that makes debulking more difficult or more challenging? So I think if one ha has a large tumor and the prolactin level is in the thousands, I think you still should try medical therapy. Um, and although the recommendations generally recommend cabergoline as a first-line drug, in our practice, we, we generally start with bromocryptine only because uh, we have various patients who, who have to pay out of pocket and can't afford the price of cabergoline. And I will tell you just from experience, I have, I didn't show the slide, but um, I have one patient with a giant invasive prolactinoma that uh, was the largest I've ever seen. Uh, the prolactin level was 40,000 and the patient has been on bromocryptine now for the last eight or nine years and the prolactin level is now down to 30 and the tumor has essentially melted away. Now not of course not everyone responds the same way but I the 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 point of the anecdote is I, there's no single magic bullet. I, I think you just have to try a number of combinations that will work 
uh, for your particular tumor. So if it's not cabergoline, then try bromocryptine. Um, in terms of does it make it more fibrous, I, I think that that's always the concern for the surgeon, but that doesn't make it a contraindication for using medication first as a first-line therapy. I have experienced some fibrosity of the tumor, but it's not always the case. Um, I think when it's used long term, longer term, say several years, then I think the risk of the tumor being fibrous tends to increase. But but you never know till you get in there and start debulking the tumor. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is mesoprolactinomas? How does it differ from micro and macro? Good question. That term came from uh, Dr. Jane's paper on acromegaly several years ago where um, we defined sort of the medium-sized tumor. Microprolactinoma is generally 10 millimeters in la or less macro adenomas are greater than 10 millimeters. The meso is the one that's between 10 to 20 millimeters. So it's that medium size, but not terribly big yet. It's not a widely accepted term yet, but it's sort of a, we're trying to introduce it into the pituitary language. Great, thank you. Uh... How much does it cost to have an initial meeting and workup with Dr. Liu, and what number would I call or email to set up appointment accordingly, and does Dr. Liu see patients from Canada? Um, I accept all patients. Um, I'm happy to, unfortunately I didn't put a slide here, but I'll verbally say it. Um, you can feel free to contact me uh, at my email, which is James dot L I U dot M D as a medical doctor at Rutgers, it's spelled down here, R U T G E R S dot E D U. So it's James dot L I U dot M D at Rutgers dot E D U. And uh, our office phone number is. 973-220, I'm sorry, 973-972-2906, that's our office number, 973-972-2906, and you can also DM me on, on uh, social media, my social media handle across all social media uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is at SkullBaseMD. So you can find me on social media at SkullBaseMD. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I am a 57-year-old female on cabergoline for 17 years with microprolactinoma with regular monitoring. I am in Canada and cabergoline is becoming harder to get. I have recently cut the dosage in half because I am trying to prolong my supply with the drug shortage. Would I be a good candidate for surgery? What is the current prolactin level and what was the initial prolactin level at the time of diagnosis? Good question. I'll wait for a follow-up on that one. Um, I can answer the next question really quick. Um, is this fantastic presentation accessible online? Yes, it will be. Um, it will be processed and edited and should be up and available on our website tomorrow. Let's see if I have that. So I'll speak a little bit to that, the question prior to that. Okay. In terms of criteria, someone who's failed medical management, um, and generally, we look at the, the tumor size. Is there still a visible focal uh, tumor that's visible on the MRI that we can surgically remove uh, and separate from the normal gland? Um, what was the original prolactin level at the time of diagnosis? And I think this is important because 
if the prolactin level was say a thousand at the time of diagnosis and you had medical treatment where the prolactin level went down to like you know 25 or something and then it recurred to a prolactin level of a hundred uh, that tumor may not be curable but uh, it may be debulked to a point where the tumor volume is now much smaller and it can potentially respond better to medical therapy or the tumor size is small enough that it's a, it becomes a favorable target for gamma knife radiosurgery. She did say um, a follow-up to the question around 100. Okay. So, I, you know, if the initial level was 100 and there's a, a focal tumor that, that one can see, I, I think it's certainly worth investigating. Great. Thank you. The patient is having headaches but isn't having other symptoms, would surgery be recommended? I think there are other factors that um, should be considered uh, other than headaches. Um, I think we have to look at the prolactin level, the size of the tumor. Was there a trial of medication? Um, the thing about headaches is headaches is such a ubiquitous symptom. Uh, there are many things that cause headaches. And I always warn patients not to hang your hat on the symptoms of headaches because one can have surgery on a pituitary tumor or a Rathke's cleft cyst and the headaches persist. So I always tell patients there's no guarantee that your headaches will improve. It might, but um, there are so many other things that can contribute to headaches that we, we can't always rely on that being the major indication for surgery. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have been on cabergoline one time per week for 20 years. Stable microadenoma size, but prolactin goes up and down 30 to 85. Side effects have of cabergoline have become bothersome and was told I can go off cabergoline and levels up to 100 are okay. Are you within childbearing age and are you in the process of starting a family? Good question. We'll wait for an answer on that. Um, let's see. In the meantime, we'll go on to one more. So I've heard that marijuana increases prolactin levels. Do you recommend avoidance of marijuana at all costs to patients who have micro, macro, prolactinomas. I've practiced in states where it was legal. I, I think when there's medication interaction um, with the dopamine pathway that elevates the prolactin, the, the, the picture tends to get complicated. So I, I think if you are on a medication such as risperidone or you're taking marijuana for medicinal purposes, uh, you should consult your endocrinologist as to how to interpret these prolactin levels when you're on medication that's trying to correct it. Okay, and then back to the last question about the one time per week for 20 years, prolactin goes up and down 30 to 85. Um, she said she is 46, but not going to have kids. So the question is, with that prolactin level of 80 to 100, is she symptomatic? Does she, does she have galactorrhea? Um, and the only concern I would have is if you have prolonged prolactin elevation as you reach postmenopausal age is the bone density. So consult your endocrinologist or your primary care physician about your bone density uh, to see if 
you know, you're a risk of osteopenia, osteoporosis. Okay. Um, I'm a 43-year-old male who's diagnosed with a 2.3 centimeter by 2.5 centimeter by 1.7 centimeter macroadenoma almost two years ago. I had prolactin of 3,400 and normal home hormonal test results with the exception of low testosterone. Tumor encroached in on the sinus cavernous. I had no symptoms of excessive prolactin except for headaches. Tumor was found when my wife and I attempted to have a third child and we sought assistance from a fertility clinic. I have been taking cabergoline for one and a half years and prolactin is in normal range, 8 to 10, but tumor has only shrunk 40%. The issue I have is high GH of 6 to 9 and IGF-1 of 270. My fear is that my tumor may be a primitive mixed tumor, possibly leading to acromegaly. I have not failed the OGTT as of now and correctly suppressed GH. Question, I had reacted so well to gabergoline for prolactin reduction. I ultimately want to medicate and hope this gets better on its own. I would also rather take octreotide than have surgery due to large tumor size and in the cavernous sinus. What is your feeling on my positive reaction to cabergoline for prolactin, but now moderating IGF-1 and GH levels? We tested IGF-1 at diagnosis of tumor, and it was 188 in normal range. Now I am 270. Any comments would be appreciative. This is kind of a complex situation. Um, you know, there are some GH secreting tumors that tend to co-secrete with prolactin. I think if your endocrinologists have done a thorough workup, which it sounds like they have, it, it doesn't sound like you have biochemical evidence of acromegaly if you are suppressing on the OGTT. Um, what, what I also want, want to know is, you know, are you exhibiting the features of acromegaly? If the tumor is still persistent, I think it would only be um, it would only be concerning if the tumor was compressing the optic nerves and causing visual deficit. If it's just invading the cavernous sinus but not causing any threat to the visual apparatus, I think continuing to be maintained on cabergoline is very reasonable until you prove that there is acromegaly before considering more medications. Okay, thank you. Um, back and forth, let's see. My daughter had surgery for a Rathke's pouch cyst when she was 15 years old. Her levels were over 200. She started out on bromocryptine but couldn't tolerate it. She has she is now 39 and has been on Dostonex for 24 years. She has had a lot of mental issues ever since. Now she is on thyroid meds because of the psych meds damage her thyroid. Your thoughts? Oh, and then the follow-up. She's very intelligent. Every time she starts to spread her wings, the rug is pulled out from under her. I feel like she has fallen through the cracks. So I'm having trouble understanding the clinical situation. Um, the, the person with the question said that she had a Rathke's cleft cyst. But right. uh, we generally don't treat Rathke's cleft cyst with Dostonex, so I'm, I'm a bit confused here. Right. And levels were over 200, but I don't know if that's prolactin levels or what the levels would be. Let me see a follow-up. Uh, and then another comment, she said that her vision is also being affected. And if she remembers correctly, her tumor was greater than 7 centimeters and yes it's prolactin that is over 200. So yeah I th it's a, this is a difficult question to answer. Um, I, I think there's so many things that one has to look at um, uh, this what it, what what of the tumors remaining uh, is it compressing the optic nerves and chiasm, uh, if the prolactin level is still elevated, are there any other medications that can falsely elevate it? 
or if it is, um, the endocrinologist needs to determine whether this is truly cabergoline resistance and considering another medication. If not considering another medication, is there is the tumor amenable to further surgical debulking? And, and if not, can this be a radiosurgical candidate? Okay. Um, if you've had an unsuccessful debulking surgery 10 years ago, would there be any elevated risks of having a second debulking surgery? And should a second debulking surgery be attempted if the tumor is still presenting as a macroplactinoma? And is a more fibrous tumor more difficult to remove, generally speaking? I think because one has had prior surgery does not prohibit another attempt. Uh, and, and it's certainly um, every individual is different. And, and so I think it's certainly worthwhile to, you know, get an opinion at uh, – a high volume experience center of excellence with, with, that may have a lot of experience doing redo or recurrent tumors. Um, there is some scar tissue that you have to go through, um, but I, I think you know someone who deals with a lot of recurrent tumors, that's not an impossible obstacle. It is challenging, but it's certainly doable, and we've had success on repeat surgeries. Uh, but certainly not without risk. There are some risks involved. There's risk of CSF leak. There's risk of uh, worsening pituitary function, and there's always risk of carotid injury. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration. Uh, again, the issue of fibrous tumor, it's always hard to predict on an MRI whether the tumor will be fibrous or not. You generally don't know until you get there, but we do have tools to uh, fight fibrous tumor. We have various types of debulkers and techniques to, to get out fibrous tumors, but uh, ultimately I think it relies on experience and judgment and knowing when to stop is always important. Uh, debulking as much as you can until you reach a, a limit or a, a safety margin, uh, and then settling for what you can get and seeing if you respond further to either further medical therapy or even consider radiosurgery. Okay. Uh, does elevated prolactin levels in adult males, levels in excess of 250 with no excess weight issues, lead to the development of gynecomastia? Are the two related in any way? I, I couldn't tell you for sure. I, I have seen some patients that have had both hyperprolactinemia and gynecomastia, but not all men develop gynecomastia. So I think there are other factors involved in that. I, I, think, I think if you have that, I think it would be best to consult your endocrinologist. Okay, thank you. Um, and going back to you, I have some additional information on, um, so this uh, original comment was I've been on cabergoline one time a week for 20 years, stable microadenoma size, but prolactin goes up and down 30 to 85. Side effects of cabergoline have become bothersome, and I was told that I can go off cabergoline and levels up to 100 are okay. And you had asked a couple of questions, and she said that she... Um, is still having periods. She's not planning on having any kids. She is having breast milk and galactorrhea. Um, and I think that was something that you had asked about. So she, it seems like she is having symptoms. But I think the question is, going off of cabergoline, is it okay if levels go up to 100? I, I think you have to look at your symptomatology. If it goes to 100 and you're having discharge of breast milk, whether that affects your quality of life. Um, if you're not having periods, but you're not in the process of having any more children, that's probably not an issue. And, and the last issue, again, is bone density. Uh, certainly prolonged 
elevated prolactin can affect bone density, so you should have that monitored as well if should you decide to stop medication. Okay, I think that covers all of our questions. I, uh, we went a little bit over. I appreciate everybody staying and listening. Excellent questions, um, great answers. And uh, Dr. Liu, thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Uh, this concludes today's webinar. We have recorded it. It will be on our website, hopefully by tomorrow. Um, if you missed any part, you can share it with your family on our website, pituitary.org, after it's edited. There's going to be a brief survey at the end. Uh, please fill that out so you can help us get you the information that you need. Thank you for joining us, and everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dr. Liu.